Bienvenidas y bienvenidos a una nueva edición de su programa Palabra de Mujer en lo que será eh, la primera parte de eh, una entrevista que le realizaremos eh, a la filósofa eh, política y teórica social Judith Butler quien ocupa la cátedra Matching Elliott eh, de Retórica, Literatura Comparada y Estudios de la Mujer en la Universidad de California, Berkeley. Eh, bienvenida, profesora Butler. Gracias. En esta entrevista nos estará colaborando la profesora de Lenguas Modernas, Adriana Jiménez, en la traducción. Doctora Butler, usted es reconocida internacionalmente, entre muchas otras cosas, por su producción teórica y activismo político en torno a la violencia de Estado. Uno de sus últimos libros, en particular, hace una crítica al sionismo como forma de gobierno en Israel. Eh, retomando autores como Walter Benjamin y Hannah Arendt, toda una tradición eh, judaica en torno a la violencia de Estado. ¿Por qué cree que es importante diferenciar entre sionismo y judaísmo? Es una, una that's a, a good question. Entiendo bien, gracias. Um, Uh, well, I think, first of all, it's important to remember that Zionism is a political movement that started officially in the late 1890s um, in, in Europe, and it envisioned a, a homeland for the Jewish people in the lands of Palestine. Um, but even then, in 1895, there was no recognition that there were people living on that land. Um, uh, it was referred to by Herzl as a land without a people. And the Jewish people were referred to as a people without a land. So it looked like a beautiful vision. <laughs> and, um, uh, and many people were inspired by this vision, especially because there was uh, so much anti-Semitism in Europe. And as we know, in the 20th century, that anti-Semitism only became worse and culminated in the Nazi genocide um, against the Jews. So um, uh, in, 19, in the 1930s and 40s, as more Jews arrived uh, from Europe in Palestine, they confronted the fact that there were Palestinians who had lived on those lands for many years and had property rights to the land as well. Um, and there were several conflicts. And I think there was a very important question that many of the Jewish immigrants had to answer in the 1940s. Would they build a state um, that was based on the principle of Jewish sovereignty, where the Jews would decide what the state would be, where the Jews would be represented by the state, or would they develop a binational state, which would include the Jewish people and the Palestinians who were already on the land. And I think they made the wrong decision. <laughs> they decided in 1948 to establish a state on the principles of Jewish sovereignty rather than a binational state in which Jews and non-Jews enjoy equal rights. Um, my sense is that that is a, a, f a failure of democracy. Um, and that failure began then and, um, and it continued as Uh, uh, 700,000, 800,000 Palestinians were in fact expelled from their homes. Now, Zionism is one part of Judaism, but Judaism is of course um, a religion that exceeds the Zionism and that has many important ethical and religious values. And one of those values is to respect the sanctity of life. Another one of those values is to um, treat your neighbor with hospitality. <laughs> Another one of those values is to uh, learn how to cohabit together, Jew and non-Jew, on the land. Many of those are strong Jewish values, and we could find them both in religious texts and in philosophical texts. Uh, my effort has been to recover a Jewish philosophical and ethical tradition that is distinct from Zionism, that prizes equality, that cares about the sanctity of life, and that um, acknowledges the rights of all refugees. Usted es reconocida también eh, por su compromiso con las políticas LGBT y los derechos humanos. Eh, Israel fue uno de los primeros ejércitos en el mundo en incluir personas gays, lesbianas y trans sí. en su ejército. Sí. Eh, ¿No cree que el precio que pagamos 
las minorías sexuales por eh, incluirnos dentro de las instituciones sin cuestionarlas es muy alta. ¿Y qué piensas sobre conceptos como homonacionalismo, sí. pinkwashing y toda esta estrategia que utilizan algunos estados como el de Israel para lavar su imagen y presentarse como yeah. progresistas y defensores de los derechos humanos? Mm -hmm. It's a good question and a difficult dilemma uh, because, um, in fact, Israel has uh, a very good record on gay, lesbian, trans human rights. It allows for gay parenting. It offers reproductive technology to lesbians very easily. Um, and the gay pride events in Tel Aviv are world famous. Um, for being um, uh, outrageous and, uh, and joyful. <laughs> so um, I, I cannot condemn that, of course. Uh, I am in favor of those rights, and it is quite important. Um, but we have to remember two different political facts. First, there is violence against gay, lesbian, trans people from the right wing in Israel. So there is internal violence. Um, it's not as if all of Israel is agreed on the rights of gay, lesbian, trans, bisexual, intersex people. It's not the case. Um, secondly, uh, I think we have to ask how uh, the advertisement of Israel as a safe haven for gay people is used um, to um, um, establish a very partial human rights record. Um, it is unfortunate that they can, uh, that it is possible for any state uh, to have an excellent human rights record in some areas and to have an absolutely terrible human rights record in other areas. So when the state of Israel uh, campaigns or uh, produces a kind of advertising um, uh, uh, machine to uh, construct Israel as um, a human rights haven, uh, what it does is it effaces the fact that it keeps um, um, uh, tens of thousands of Palestinians under indefinite detention um, in prisons where they have no legal representation, where they are let go only to be re-arrested uh, within weeks. Um, um, it, it, it deflects from the human rights record that it has um, in uh, relationship to civilian killings in Gaza, which are war crimes. It deflects from its terrible human rights records when it, um, that, is, that, is, that is made clear in, in, in the way in which it denies rights of mobility to people who live in, in the West Bank. It denies rights of free expression for those who have um, overt uh, political criticisms of the state. Um, who, or who call for a two-state solution, or who even call for a radical democratic alternative to political Zionism, right? So very often those who ask for equality are considered to be potential terrorists. Um, there are severe restrictions on mobility, free speech. The prison um, system is appalling and it does not conform with international norms and the war crimes against Gaza, the explicit targeted killing of civilians is unacceptable under any international law. So we have to look at the full picture. I think that's my view. Thank you. Eh, in Costa Rica hay un fuerte movimiento conservador religioso que tiene eh, mucho poder institucional, que tiene asiento en la estructura del Estado. Y este movimiento se opone a cualquier forma de reconocimiento en términos de derechos laborales para las personas que ejercen trabajo sexual. Lamentablemente muchas veces eh, su posicionamiento encuentra eco en un feminismo oficial que es de corte abolicionista y ve en la prostitución y en cualquier forma de trabajo sexual eh, una forma de esclavitud. ¿Cuál es su posición respecto a este viejo dilema oh, en okay. el feminismo? Ok, I think I understood. Would you like me to? Yes. Mm, he's asking uh, basically your position in terms of uh, a classical type of feminism that views sex work as slavery and to torture. In mm -hmm. the context of like Costa Rica where we have a very strong movement from the right wing uh, mm -hmm. 
sector yes. to abolish uh, sex work, yes. and it's backed up by some of the feminism in this country. Right. And that right-wing structure is also religious to some religious degree? Religious and institutional. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. Um, <coughs> well, uh, uh, I, I belong to that um, history uh, of the feminist movement that uh, believes that sex work is work mm -hmm. um, and it should be treated like work. In other words, sex workers should be given safe conditions sex workers should be able to engage in that work um, only on a consensual basis. Um, sex workers should be um, uh, given good health care uh, and provided even with um, uh, uh, retirement benefits. And, um, and of course, uh, I am against human trafficking. Uh, I am against coercion but I do not accept the idea that all sex work is coerced. I think that is false. I think that underestimates what women's agency is. It's a certain kind of work. Sometimes it's temporary, sometimes it's long-term. Sometimes people go in and out of it. Um, uh, I know sex workers who have said it's much better work than being trapped in an office all day. Um, so I think that uh, we have to um, we have to make the work conditions for sex work better. That I believe in. Um, uh, and I think we, we need to oppose human trafficking and we need to oppose uh, coercion um, and exploitation within the sex work industry uh, without identifying sex work as coercive or as enslavement or such. Um, we need to be very careful about these distinctions. Usted se ha preguntado en su obra, en varios de sus libros, ¿qué es la vida? ¿Quién cuenta como valioso? ¿Y quién no? Y, y también ha hablado ampliamente sobre la precariedad que constituye lo humano y lo no humano. ¿Qué tratamiento le daría o cómo abordaría la dicotomía humanidad y animalidad? ¿Y consideraría el vegetarianismo una propuesta ética no violenta? Ajá. Bueno. <laughs> um, okay, um, well, um, let's take the example of war, all right. Um, what does war do? It, in war, certain populations are targeted, um, certain areas are targeted. Um, uh, what is affected by, by the bombing of certain areas? What is affected by attacks on certain areas? Well, humans suffer. But animals suffer, and the environment suffers. So, for instance, in Iraq, I believe that the United States has produced toxic soil, which means that all living creatures are suffering from living now where their water is polluted and their soil is toxic. I think we need to um, understand that precarious life uh, can uh, refer to all uh, living processes and that under conditions of intense pollution or war or um, uh, um, the systematic abandonment of agricultural areas, um, living processes suffer. Uh, living processes have to be supported in order to um, continue. Uh, and that means that uh, uh, natural environments have to be protected, uh, human and animal creatures have to be have to have access to food and shelter. Um, and uh, so I think precarious life is not an anthropocentric concept, um, although I think it affects humans differently. Right? We, we, we should be able to talk about the way in which human populations are affected by precarious conditions, especially when those conditions are produced by the economic system. Um, uh, especially when some humans become more poor all the time and other humans become more rich all the time. Well, how do we understand those accelerating inequalities? I want us to be able to think about that at the same time that we recognize that human and animal life are, are connected. Um, the second question that you have about an ethics of nonviolence, um, I do think uh, that um, it is important to consider um, uh, uh, the institutional 
uh, means by which both animals and humans are um, inflicted with violence. Um, I don't think we can separate those issues. En su pensamiento teórico político, interpreto siempre la necesidad de encontrar nuevas formas políticas de izquierda. ¿Se sigue considerando usted una pensadora política y una activista política de izquierda? ¿Y qué vigencia tiene en el marco eh, global de políticas de austeridad y neoliberalismo, donde la desposesión eh, se instituye como un mecanismo institucionalizado y la violencia también? Uh -huh. <risa> <laughs> it's a, another very good question. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could answer uh, your questions fully. I wish I had an answer to that very important and urgent question. <laughs> um, I think right now uh, it is an interesting moment for what we could call the left um, uh, because there are popular movements that uh, are moving into um, government, like as we see in Greece with Syriza and as we see in Spain with Podemos. Um, and there may be some, some others that also are in this liminal uh, uh, position. And of course, um, it raises all kinds of questions. Uh, uh, what is lost when a social movement, a popular social movement on the left becomes part of the state apparatus? Uh, what is gained in terms of power and influence? Um, and I think right now we're seeing debates um, on the so-called left um, <laughs> ab about whether or not we should be entering into state politics at all, or whether the state itself is part, and state violence in particular, is part of the problem. As you know, there's an anarchist left that believes that it's more important to oppose the state and state violence um, uh, than to become a party or um, a program within state politics. And there are others who say, no, that is naive. We must, uh, we must enter into state politics in order to fight for economic equality or greater democratization. Um, I take this antagonism to be a constitutive feature of contemporary left politics. I don't think it will be reconciled quickly. I'm not sure it should be reconciled. I think maybe we need that antagonism to stay alive so that we remember that whoever is in power, whoever is elected, depends on, on, popular, on the popular will, um, and that popular movements need always to stay alive to check state power. So I believe that this is an important antagonism. Um, I, don't, uh, um, I don't take sides, I, but I am interested in the, in the antagonism, and I think it is a productive one. En Costa Rica, eh, ayer en la disertación que quedaba en, aquí en la Universidad de Costa Rica, usted hablaba sobre la necesidad de salirse de una concepción de sexualidad centrada y constreñida por lo reproductivo. Mm. Eh, Costa Rica es uno de los pocos países del mundo que no tiene un marco jurídico que reconozca las técnicas de reproducción asistida, en particular la fertilización in vitro. Sin embargo, cuando uno se acerca a los sectores progresistas, se encuentra que claman por este derecho, por el acceso y la garantización de este derecho, se encuentra con argumentos conservadores ligados a la familia heterosexista y a los roles de maternidad y paternidad tradicionales. ¿Cómo repensar el parentesco más allá de garantizar el acceso a, a estos derechos? Okay. And the status of access to reproductive rights in Costa Rica right now it's, is? There's like three countries in the world that don't allow it. In vitro is illegal In, right I, in vitro is illegal mm -hmm. right now. And the reasons that are given for, the, for keeping in vitro fertilization illegal? That it does some of the methods of the technique in, in, involve aborting viable... Viable life? Yes, life. Okay. Well, of course, there's a, 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 a local problem, I presume, um, because um, uh, there, there, are sh there are surely traditional and religious reasons why, um, why people in Costa Rica would oppose in vitro fertilization. So if anyone wanted to uh, argue in favor of it, I, I, I'm imagining that those debates would have to 
take place in a local way that took into account what people's concerns are. Um, so I don't want to be a first world uh, uh, <laughs> North American who comes in mm -hmm. and says what the truth mm -hmm. is. Um, because I think these political battles do function locally to some degree. They also benefit from international debate and from global consensus. Um, in most places that I know, um, the debates have had to um, center on what is life, when does life begin, what is the viability of life, um, uh, and um, uh, and, um, and, and very often the debates on abortion are linked to the debates on in vitro fertilization. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the argument completely, but um, in vitro fertilization does involve um, 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 the fertilization of, of of some eggs rather than others, um, but that is also the case in so-called natural heterosexual intercourse. Some eggs are fertilized and some are not. So there is no reproduction without a principle of selectivity, if you see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mean to belittle the debate, but uh, it, is, um, it is unfortunate. My guess is that in vitro fertilization is frightening for some people because it um, it takes away the centrality of the man to the um, and and the heterosexual act of reproduction to the um, to the act of reproduction itself. But it does um, expand choices uh, for women, um, and I think that's an important principle to keep in mind. In the recent years, estuvo in Mexico. Y es donde brindó una conferencia en la UNAM y habló sobre la desposesión forzada y la violencia institucionalizada como mecanismo institucionalizado. También en un diálogo reciente con una política, eh, con, con una teórica e intelectual griega, habla, digamos, sobre las posibilidades del reconocimiento del sujeto capaz de agencia aún y gracias a la desposesión. ¿Cómo hacer en, este vínculo entre agencia y desposesión? Entre, res, entre resistencia y creación y desposesión forzada. Okay, you can give that to me again. <laughs> um, he is wanting you to elaborate a little on the relationship between um, forced dispossession mm -hmm. and agency. I see. In terms of like resistance and cre creativity in face of um, dispossession. I see. I see. Um, well, I think that um, in the context of that particular uh, conferencia, um, I um, was trying to um, bring attention to the fact that many people who are in exceedingly vulnerable positions or in exceedingly precarious positions um, nevertheless do find ways of mobilizing and they very often find ways of mobilizing that are outside of state or institutional uh, mechanisms. Um, and um, uh, one of the problems um, with the way that vulnerability is sometimes discussed is that an entire population is called a vulnerable population. When a vulnerable population is identified within um, human rights discourse, that usually implies that there is an obligation on the part of a paternalistic organization, either a state authority or an international authority, to uh, protect the vulnerable population, at which point the field of power looks like this. There are those who are vulnerable and there are those with the power to protect them. What's missing from the picture is that the vulnerable also have their own powers, um, uh, sometimes effective powers, sometimes not effective powers. But um, when, we, when we look to see uh, what happens in the massive precarity um, demonstrations in Chile, when the students uh, emerge to, on the street to demand um, their right to a free and, or affordable education, or um, um, uh, in the UK, or in Rome, or in, in, in any number of places where uh, economic, 
uh, dispossession is the norm. Um, uh, all of these anti-austerity or precarity demonstrations involve those who are f affected, who are vulnerable, who are suffering, coming together, gathering, and also resisting. So it's not as if they overcome their vulnerability to resist. They are vulnerable and they are resisting, and it's both. Now, you know, in Mexico, it's very clear that, you know, the students in Ayotzinapa, they were very vulnerable when they gathered. They knew they were vulnerable. Uh, there's no doubt about that. They did not know they would die. But there's a fear of gathering and protesting in, in the region of Guerrero. Everybody knows that. And it's, there's a fear of gathering and protesting in, in Mexico City as well. Um, one is subject to police power. One is subject to violence. Um, and the question is, um, how is it that people who know that they are in an exposed and vulnerable situation still resist? And I want to say that mm, it is important to keep in mind that um, the vulnerable can resist. And um, one of the problems with being extremely poor or radically dispossessed is that you can become hopeless about acting at all. Um, but um, I do believe that, there, that that means that it is most important to remind ourselves and each other that vulnerability is not the opposite of action. It can be brought into action, it can be mobilized in forms of resistance. And this happens most effectively when there are large gatherings, when the gatherings become larger and larger, and where the networks of solidarity are expanding. Agradecerle por la entrevista en nombre de Palabra de Mujer y por la oportunidad de venir aquí a Costa Rica eh, y a Adriana por toda la ayuda con la traducción. Y de esta forma llegamos a esta edición de Palabra de Mujer. Eh, les invito a continuar eh, con la segunda parte de esta entrevista, a acompañarnos en ella.